our next presentation, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Alan Williams from the National Computational Infrastructure Australia. Dr. Williams is the Associate Director responsible for services and technology at the National Computational Infrastructure based in Canberra. In this role, he is responsible for the delivery of HPC, cloud, and storage services to Australian researchers from around the country. Prior to his start at NCI in 2013, he was responsible for university-wide corporate and student IT services, including networking, cybersecurity, and telephony. Today, Dr. Williams will present the future of scientific computing. Dr. Williams, thank you very much for joining us today. Please begin. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me or not? Yes, I can, and I see your slides. Okay. Oh, good. All right. Um, uh, first of all, um, I'm not Dr. Williams. I'm just Mr. Williams. Um, I haven't uh, gone through the, the pain of uh, completing a PhD. So, but thank you anyway for the honor. Um, who knows one day. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just trying to get the, uh, the next slide going. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands that we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. Uh, normally I would say uh, in particular to our Ngunnawal people, uh, who are Canberra based here, but given that we're meeting right around the country and potentially around the world, um, the, the local first people um, as appropriate for you. Um, for those of the you that missed the uh, presentation from Professor Sean Smith yesterday about NCI, just a, a quick brief update of who we are. Um, NCI is the uh, founded through a, a collaboration between the Australian National University here in Canberra, CSIRO, our National Science Agency, the Bureau of Meteorology, and Geoscience Australia, and all the major research uh, universities throughout the country. And our role is to provide a highly integrated uh, computer, computational environment for Australian researchers for the benefit of um, Australian research and to drive innovation. So in short, to provide world-class High performance advanced computing services to Australians. And of course, um, NCI is the home to Australia's fastest research supercomputer, um, Guardi, uh, which was commissioned earlier this year. And here it is in all its glory, uh, taking up less space than our older machine, uh, Rigen, and uh, a significant boost in, in performance and nearly three times uh, the number of nodes that are available. Uh, but um, 2020 has certainly um, made the case for HPC. Uh, in Canberra and in Australia, we had um, severe drought and then followed in January by severe bushfires around our country, uh, a little bit like the, the US is suffering at the moment. Uh, the bushfires generated so much smoke that it became a health hazard for many of the people in Canberra to the extent that um, our buildings had to be had the fire alarms turned off uh, because they just kept going off with the amount of smoke that was coming inside. Um, thankfully, um, Gaudi, uh, just fresh out of the box, was able to keep on running and continued on. Um, the drought was then broken by um, rain and a severe hailstorm later in early January. And you can see a couple of images there and uh, all the cars in our car park were then trashed by uh, these large hailstones. And of course, uh, now we're in the era of COVID-19. So HPC has never been um, needed more than it is today um, in helping us work through some of the predictions for these extreme weather events and addressing some of the, the national and international pandemic issues that we're facing. Um, NCI has been uh, has a, had a long-term relationship with climate and weather. Uh, our original reason for creation was to be a climate and weather centre uh, for supporting that, and it has grown to support other HPC um, services. Um, and unfortunately, uh, even though we've suffered a number of disasters this year, our colleagues at CSIRO are telling us that uh, we can expect a tripling in the frequency of these uh, major events uh, 
can impact and cause devastation. Um, and uh, even though it was uh, only just commissioned, uh, Gaudi was used as part of our response to the, the bushfires. Um, we were assisting with the Bureau of Meteorology in actually looking at the experiment models and actually seeing where fire fronts were going to be going. Uh, the aim, of course, is to try and further refine this, and the hope is that we can reduce the risk to firefighters and the community into the future. COVID-19, again, um, something that I don't think any of us expected to have the impact that it has had. And in response, NCI, along with uh, the Palsy, uh, the other civic meeting centre, based in Perth, issued a uh, an immediate call for to support researchers um, focused on the COVID research. Um, one of the underlying themes that came out from all of the researchers and the research groups that were awarded time is the need for large high performance computing resources, uh, the need of scale and the computational uh, complexities and availability of the services that are available locally. So what is the future of scientific computing going to be? Um, and to borrow a quote from Shakespeare, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than the dreamt in your philosophy or your science. Um, it's a little bit like second guessing with the crystal ball. Um, you can see here our image uh, associated with Gardi, uh, which is actually uh, painted by the Nice churches and represents uh, the confluence between uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, the white man's knowledge and coming together, being guided by the, the, the elders and um, the idea of the, the different lines through it is to re represent the model paths to searching for the answers and uh, discovery. And truly that's what science is. Um, it's a little bit hard to know what's coming next. So in some ways, we have to try and be ready for everything that we can. So what are we seeing um, as a facility in the research domains? We're seeing demands for increased HPC services. Uh, we're seeing a growing scale in the jobs that are being um, used on the systems. And we'll have heard from Richard today uh, about the um, the growth and the complexity in some of those jobs as you go into higher resolutions. Um, we're also seeing an increasing number of disciplines starting to move to HPC that have discovered the advantages of digital printing. Um, and there's also an increasing need to have integrated workflows. So gone are the days of just having a standalone high performance computer system. There's a requirement now for pre or post processing of that data because of the volumes of data that are associated with, with it. We need cloud compute, we need edge computing, and we need large amounts of storage. In the technology side of things, um, we're seeing increased competition between chip manufacturers. So we've seen the, the resurrection of AMD um, from knocking or knocking on the door of Intel. Uh, who have been a, a market leader for quite some time. Uh, we're seeing uh, a number of ARM chip manufacturers and service systems appearing in our uh, ecosystem. Uh, obviously with Fugaku, uh, now the number one machine being an ARM machine. Um, it's adding the challenges to getting that uh, cross platform capability and portability. Um, we're seeing increased demands for GPUs uh, obviously with the NVIDIA GPU, and also now with AMD producing its own GPU. We're seeing new accelerator technologies and specialist chips. So the FPGAs uh, are coming to the fore for some of the, the bioinformatic workloads where they can focus on a particular task and deliver it. Um, also in that market, and I'm sure Alison will follow up, We've probably seen a decreasing number of major companies that are actually uh, being known as traditional HPC vendors. And we're seeing a growth in startup and niche companies and solutions. 
So we're seeing uh, an array of solutions designed for um, individual situations and ways to try and um, link these together is becoming increasingly complex. So the challenge therefore for our systems is really we need to be adaptable and agile to meet the demands and um, that agility is actually hampered as soon as we, you start looking at the large infrastructure required to support some of these systems. It's, it's great to be agile, but how do we do it uh, to make it all work together? Um, so the demands of our systems are really, so we have to provide solution you know, that is big. We have to provide a system that's robust um, and resilient so that work can happen on it. Um, ideally, it needs to be a powerful system to provide the computational grunt that um, our research is required. Energy efficiency is, is key um, with the increasing size of these machines, the increasing usage of the electricity costs, as we heard from, from Tim Wee yesterday, the amount of uh, greenhouse gases associated with just cooling the systems is becoming uh, more of a concern. So anything we can do to make it more efficient is important. Um, I've already alluded to the need for more storage um, as we see larger and larger data sets, either in an AI space, uh, machine learning for training, or just uh, the large amount of IoT data coming back and then being computed into a model. Um, we need some way to store that and the results. Cost effective, um, it's great to have the world's best solution, but if you can't afford to run it, then nobody's going to use it. Um, we're seeing demand. Um, and people want more high memory nodes. So they wanted to be able to do things in RAM to operate faster. Um, obviously demand for AI and machine learning is, is increasing. Um, there's a need for greater security um, in our systems. Uh, we're seeing a need for integrated environments. Uh, people are wanting easy access onto the, our systems and they want it to be simple to use. So, how are we going in meeting that challenge at um, MCI? Well, we can tick a few of the boxes. So, with Guardi, our new machine, it's big. Um, it's now nearly three times the number of cores available compared to our old supercomputer in Ryzen. We've increased the robustness of the system uh, by now installing redundant uh, scratch file systems so that the loss of the scratch file system doesn't take out all of the computer or all the jobs. We can now load balance between the two. And we've also split the system into different failure domains. So the, in the event of a cooling failure, um, we will only lose part of the machine. Uh, the aim is to try and keep as much of the machine up and running at all the time. And of course, um, Gaudi is ranked number 24 in the top 500, and so it's currently the most powerful academic machine that we have in Australia. Um, Gaudi also takes a few more boxes for us. It's direct liquid cooling. And again, Tim, we touched on this and the advantages of it. Because we're actually running water over the chips, we actually are able to collect a lot of that heat and then use that in free cooling. So it means that the the inlet temperature for our water is 30 odd degrees or higher. And we can take advantage of the environment that we're here in Canberra. So when the water leaves at, at 40, 45 plus degrees Celsius, the ambient air temperature allows us just to cool that water. Um, so much so that we have no um, chillers associated with uh, the Guardi operations available to us. Um, for the HPC, it's all free cooling. Um, more storage, as indicated, um, we have the redundant scratch file systems. Um, Gaudi actually has 20 petabytes of scratch file systems. Uh, so that's split into two 10 petabyte file systems. Part of the rationale for that, again, is that operations of, uh, if one has to go down for maintenance, we can still keep working with the other. The other request we're seeing 
and is coming soon, is the purging policy associated with it. So people are very keen to use, obviously, the fastest disk available on the Scratch file system, but it's a limited resource, even 20 petabytes uh, can be used up quite easily with some of these projects. And it's a matter of actually making sure that it's free and available for everybody. Um, it has to be cost effective. And um, those of you who were at the, this conference last year uh, would have heard some of the trials and tribulations of the, the tender process that we were going through. And uh, the selection of Gadi, uh, one of the, the key things we had was it was the best um, total cost of ownership at the time of purchase. Um, and that's an important thing to remember that everything we do is a point in time. Um, and so we have to be continually uh, enabling the systems to adapt and move forward. As part of the adaption and moving onto the new system, more hard memory nodes. We now have 50 nodes offering uh, 1.5 terabytes of the Intel Optane persistent memory, memory, memory. Um, giving us 580 uh, terabytes across all of Gardi, so nearly half a petabyte of RAM um, and RAM-like capabilities are available to our users. And this means that when people want to run um, sequence aligning um, or some of the large uh, models, more can be done in memory, uh, speeding up performance. The new system has 640 of the NVIDIA, NVIDIA B100 GPUs, and um, with Intel's Cascade Lake uh, CPUs with VNI or the uh, Vector Neural Network Instruction Set, we've added more support for artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, simplifying the way that people can uh, use TensorFlow. In fact, um, as of this week, I'm happy to announce that um, we've actually installed the NVIDIA HPC SDK, which provides our users with um, more optimized libraries for the GPU environments and some additional compiler options that were previously not available to us. Um, greater security. So as part of our new machine, we've also increased the amount of network monitoring that we're seeing. And one of the new things that we've done is we restricted storage mounts so that when a HPC job runs on the system, you have to request um, specifically which file systems you want available, and only those projects that you have access to will become available to your um, application. This stops the uh, accidental problem with somebody leaving a file system open or not setting the permissions correctly at the top level, um, and then having data loss or data modified. Um, Integrated environments. So one of the strengths of NCI has been the ability to provide an integrated environment for our researchers. So for some time when on Bryogen, people were able to use uh, virtual desktops to able to submit jobs to the HPC, and this has continued with um, Gardi as well. Um, we we're also seeing the cross-mounting of directories uh, so that work that was done on the HPC file system is available within our cloud environment um, for pre or post processing. And as part of the new system, we also have a flexible Dragonfly IB topology. And this is a, an island based topology which allows us to put a number of systems together and um, allows us to grow in a fairly simple way. Um, Here's a quick overview of just what the integrated environment looks like. Um, you can see, um, hopefully, uh, the Gardi login and data member nodes and the Gardi compute, sort of the core of the HPC system. But over to the right, you'll also see that we've brought back the Agility cluster, the raw raw nodes that were associated with Rigen, and the Skylake nodes. Again, the idea being is to try and provide uh, a greater amount of capability to our researchers and to make use of the, the capacity and the, the sunk costs that have already been uh, expended. So trying to make it a, a cost-effective solution for all of our researchers. 
Um, you'll also see the linkages through to our VMware environments uh, for cloud and the OpenStack environment. And on the, the far left uh, of the screen, you also see a bit of a dotted box, the new Rygen cloud. So um, given that we have a large amount of compute in our old supercomputer, uh, we are looking at ways that we can actually reuse this capability to enhance um, the size uh, of our cloud environments so that uh, more researchers can have these integrated workflows and the capability there. So that's our integrated environments. Easy to access. So um, how do we say we're easy to access? Well, more maritime is available because we've got more nodes available and more nodes have been added. As Sean indicated yesterday, with Australian Leadership for Computing Grants, um, nearly uh, 220 million compute hours have been awarded, uh, just in additional uh, top-up grants. This is over and above uh, the NCMAS, the National Merit Allocation Scheme, which is due to open um, in the next couple of weeks. In addition to that, we're also working on what we can do better and how we can improve things. So we are considering um, how we can actually um, develop a new scheme that's targeted and supports um, high performance um, data workflows or cloud link workflows along with the AI and machine learning that traditionally doesn't always get a Guernsey as part of these large um, HPC um, applications. We're also in investigating whether there's any advantage in increasing the frequency of of access to these calls. So instead of having an annual call for merit allocation schemes, whether we can change the cadence associated with that so that we have um, more opportunities for researchers to uh, apply for time when they require it and to make it available uh, in an agile uh, fashion, basically. And of course, um, a greater opportunity for industry um, as we're seeing, the need for HPC is growing across the, the board and industry um, and researchers within the industry um, have a need for facilities that outstrip what they're capable of having. Um, the last thing um, that we've, we've been asked and that people want to see, we need to make it simpler to use. Um, and so behind the scenes, um, there's a new software framework that's been adopted by administrators. And as part of that, it means that when we compile our software, it's actually optimized for the platform that you're going to run on. So um, regardless of the, the application, um, if it'll run on the Broggle nodes or the Skylake nodes or the Cascade Lake nodes, um, whichever queue you submit to when you load that module, it will load the appropriate um, binary to enable you to have the best performance on that architecture. Also coming soon um, is some graphical login nodes. Um, and again, this is aimed at trying to make it easier for users that are not traditional command line HPC users to, to get online and to see the benefits. Um, still to come, um, and things that we would like to have actually rolled out, but due to various um, uh, smoke, hail, and um, COVID. It's sort of slightly delayed where we would like to be. Um, we're looking at installing uh, the IO intensive file system on demand. So this will be a file system that will be available on a per job basis uh, with NVMe, and this will be available across the fabric. And the idea being that by providing this high-speed file system, we can reduce the impact on other users and the Lustre file systems. Again, the focus is around on looking for ways to support small I.O. or, or very heavy I.O. Um, in the system to meet whatever comes next from our researchers. Multi-factor authentication, again, it's the next step up with um, security and will be rolled out before the end of this year. As we've seen across the world this year, 
and last year uh, a number of HPC centers have been uh, attacked and been used for Bitcoin and all sorts of things. Uh, this is a way of protecting our user data and protecting our resources. Also this year, you should see some upgrades to our mass data file system. Uh, we're looking at ways where we can make it easier for users to engage with it and improve the performance of the, the archiving file space for people. And lastly, one of the things that we've been working on is greater international collaboration opportunities for researchers here in Australia. Um, and looking at ways that we can leverage um, support and joint calls with external organisations to provide um, exascale style um, support um, and preparation as Australia builds its capability. Um, that's all I've got for today. So thank you. If there's any questions, um, otherwise I'll I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thank you.